My name is Rasagna Kusaraju. I'm a fourth year medical student going into pediatrics. And this overview will be about germinal matrix intraventricular hemorrhages. Quickly, we will be going through definitions, epidemiology, general imaging guidelines, complications, and the uh, current and official grading system, as well as images. So what is the germinal matrix? This area is visible at 8 to 28 weeks gestation and in premature neonates, which is before 37 weeks gestation. This area is located in the lateral ventricles and consists of very fragile cells, differentiating to neural and glial cells. The germinal matrix intraventricular hemorrhage, which is the topic that we are discussing. This is a hemorrhage which occurs in the capillary beds of the germ germinal matrix and can progress into the lateral ventricles when subjected to things like hypoxia and or increased venous pressure. So when should we be concerned? This goes into the epidemiology. The incidence and severity is inversely correlated with gestational age. So 24 weeks or less in gestational age, this age group is at the highest risk. Those that are also of low birth weight um, or very low birth weight defined as less than 1500 grams are also at the highest risk. Overall, the incidence has actually decreased over the years, likely due to the use of antenatal glucocorticoids and improvement in ventilators in our NICUs. However, about 40% of low birth weight preterm infants develop germinal matrix intraventricular hemorrhages in the first three days of life. This then increases to 50% by day five and 72% by day seven. And it is also important to keep in mind that the mortality increases exponentially the higher the grade. So grade one being 4%, grade two being 10%, grade three being 18%, and what was previously known as grade four being 40%. There are many risk factors to consider, as previously elucidated, one of which includes genetic predisposition. At current, there is inconclusive evidence. Another risk factor is prenatal issues, which includes maternal preeclampsia and endomethacin slash aspirin use. There could be labor and delivery issues, such as the type of delivery uh, the fetus being in breech position and delayed cord clamping. There can also be a host of postnatal issues, which will increase the risk. This includes neonatal transport, bicarb therapy, metabolic acidosis, pneumothorax, hypothermia, coagulation abnormalities, and low hematocrit. There are general imaging guidelines as well as NICU-specific guidelines based on the hospital system you are a part of. Cranial ultrasound is preferred with views from anterior and mastoid fontanelles. You can also obtain posterior fontanelle and vascular images. It is also important to note that MRIs are better at detecting temporal and occipital germinal matrix intraventricular hemorrhages. In infants with gestational age less than 30 weeks, it is important to do a routine screening at day seven to 10, and you can screen earlier if the infant is symptomatic. Uh, this is repeated at four to six weeks or term equivalent or at discharge. In infants with gestational age greater than 30 weeks, screening is recommended if risk factors that we previously discussed are present or as clinically indicated. In the NICU, 
Um, and as mentioned previously, this may differ based on the hospital system. Um, you do it once for infants less than 32 weeks gestational age on day one. For infants gestational age less than 28 weeks, they're screening on day one, uh, two to three additional times in the first week, then weekly until 34 weeks, then biweekly after 34 weeks, and once at discharge or at term. For infants greater than 28 weeks gestational age, screening is done on day one, day four to seven, weekly until 34 weeks, and at discharge or at term. Once again, this may differ the NICU guidelines based on your hospital system. There are many complications. It is important to note that germinal matrix intraventricular hemorrhage is rarely an isolated lesion and is associated with white matter injury, paraventricular leukomalacia, necrosis in the pons, cerebellar lesions, blockage of villi, post-hemorrhagic hydrocephalus, and cavitation of hemorrhage. Please note the pictures seen. The image on the left um, shows how paraventricular leukomalacia can be cystic. And on the right, you can see a better view. Note that the enlargement of the ventricles is chronic secondary to white matter volume loss. The grading system is based on bleeding, involvement of white matter, and presence of ventricular distension. Grades one and two are considered mild, and grades three and what was previously known as grade four, and now called periventricular hemorrhagic infarction, or PVHI, are both considered severe. The grades can be unilateral or bilateral, otherwise known as symmetric or asymmetric. Where is the germinal matrix? This is in the subependymal region, seen in what's called the caudothalamic groove which means that it is located between the caudate nucleus, which is seen in this sagittal view here uh, in yellow, and between the thalamus, which is outlined in green. It is this shallow groove projecting from the floor of the lateral ventricle at the level of foramen of Monroe. Be sure to distinguish the germinal matrix from the choroid plexus, which is echogenic and seen here as indicated by the yellow arrow. Now let's delve deeper into the grading system. So grade one is confined to the germinal matrix or with up to 10% of the lateral ventricular area. The left image shown on the side is in the sagittal view and shows the hemorrhage is confined to the germinal matrix. The image on the right shows the caudal view and indicates that this is one-sided and thus would be grade one and asymmetrical. Grade two is defined as the hemorrhage with extension into normal sized lateral ventricles with 10 to 50% of volume. The image on the left is once again the sagittal view and you can see by the white arrow um, located at the bottom, this hemorrhage is also layering in the occipital horn. Grade three will occupy more than 50% of lateral ventricles, and you will also see this acute ventricular dilatation. You can see this on the image on the left with the lateral ventricle being quite enlarged. And you can also see this in the image on the right, the coronal view. And in this case, 
the hemorrhage is on both sides, uh, making it bilateral and or symmetric. What was previously known as grade four is now known as periventricular hemorrhagic infarction or PVHI. This is defined as grade three with infarction into the periventricular white matter as shown in the images below. The image on the left in the sagittal view, you can clearly see as indicated by the arrow, the infarction has extended into this white matter. And you can see this in the coronal view on the right as well on one side. Please note that it was originally thought the, that the hemorrhage was an extension of ventricular hemorrhage but is now thought to be secondary to venous infarction caused by compression of deep terminal veins by this expanded ventricle filled with blood. Please refer to the following references for additional information on the topic. And with that, I thank you for your attention.